Now I'd request uh, Madam Aditi Iyer from the uh, Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, to take us across her presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I thought I'd start my presentation without uh, a lot of <coughs> pomp and ceremony, but uh, with two disclaimers. The first disclaimer is that while I'm here, I'm actually uh, representing a much larger team of people, and I'm really happy that two of my colleagues are here today, Anu and uh, Priya. Um, and so when I present work, it's not my work alone, but it's everybody's uh, work. Uh, the second thing is that um, we are presenting a work that we've been doing in Koppal district in northern Karnataka. And uh, the reason why uh, we feel very privileged to be here is because we've been working in Koppal for a long time. And that's given us a really a good opportunity to see close at hand how two maternal health policies have actually played out on the ground. So my second disclaimer is about the worm's eye view because Priya said, well, you know, worms go underground. And I said, oh gosh, I didn't think about that. But I really want to say that if, if, I'm, if I'm claiming this is a worm's eye view, then it's the kind of worm that, uh, that, that crawls on the surface and doesn't go underground. So hopefully this is a realistic picture of what is happening um, over time uh, and with views from the ground. Um, so what are my questions? So there are really two questions that, are drive, that will drive my presentation. Um, the first is to prevent, uh, present evidence on how two policies in the area of maternal health have been playing out on the ground. The first is in the policy to support institutional deliveries to reduce maternal health. And the second is to institute uh, maternal death audits as a way by which health systems can learn from uh, failed uh, events and therefore uh, take lessons on board. Uh, and the second objective of the presentation is to explore the reasons why there might be gaps between policy intent and policy implementation and point to the consequences of this gap. Um, what so what are our, you know why why are we a credible voice so why am i trying to persuade you that uh, you know that uh, that we are spelling out a credible story uh, we've been in, uh, working in Koppal district uh, for over 10 years now on maternal safety and rights since 2003. Uh, and the idea of the project is not to really uh, deliver services or to develop a service delivery model that can be upscaled, but to really be there and do a number of different activities that would allow us to see how things pan out on the ground and to really understand why maternal deaths happen and therefore what are the barriers uh, that need to be addressed in order to reduce uh, the prevalence of uh, maternal death. So we've been doing a combination of research and actions. I won't get into it. Suffice to say that it takes us, you know, to the villages. It takes us to uh, district level meetings. And, uh, you know, uh, the idea is to link up communities and uh, health workers um, using a number of different uh, approaches and activities. So coming to the first policy, which is of institutional delivery. So what has happened? There's been, since 2008, the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009, as everybody here in the room knows, active you know, demand generation by ASHA's availability of free transportation has led to a huge increase in the number of institutional deliveries. It was around 25% uh, in 2007-8. Currently, it is uh, much higher. The, the, uh, figures that uh, were being claimed last year or the year before was, you know, uh, 60, 65, which is a huge increase. And there may be issues around how deaths get counted as institutional deliveries. But nevertheless, there's no getting away from the fact that the numbers have increased um, quite tremendously. But the number of deaths don't seem to have come down. Now, the CAG reports for Karnataka, uh, you know, said, it, it, they were shocked and they said, well, you know, actually MMR has gone up from 2008 uh, to 2011 and the significant, the increases that they quoted were quite significant. Now, our sense from the ground is that, well, actually the reporting has gone up. And the reporting is much better now because it comes through the ICDS uh, department as well. And therefore, while the numbers might seem alarmingly high now, it's actually really a function of better reporting and 
the, the sense we have is that the numbers have probably stayed around the same uh, and they haven't really increased that much. So then it really begs a question, so what's happening and why is there a gap between policy intent and policy outcomes? Now we've got two sources of evidence to really uh, interrogate the question and one is verbal autopsies that we've been doing on a continuous basis in all project villages which until um, 2011 were 67 villages in Koppal um, and uh, we started in 2004 and 5 with impromptu investigations that just happened because we were there and we felt that we had to do it and over time we've developed a much more rigorous methodology that is in depth that's qualitative, that really triangulates evidence from multiple sources and which is focused primarily on identifying the missed opportunities for death prevention because the assumption that we go with is that most deaths are preventable and there are multiple stakeholders who have a role to play in preventing deaths and therefore when a death happens there are failures and the failures can be on the part of families, communities but also health systems and the idea of of the invest of the uh, verbal autopsies is to find out so you know who failed in what way um, and therefore if the, if the rest of my presentation appears very um, uh, depressing it's only because it's focused on deaths and deaths is inherently a depressing outcome the second is um, the operations research that we've been doing to look at uh, uh, knowledge of uh, providers in PHCs and CHCs because one of the things that came from the verbal autopsies is that there may be actually uh, health system failures at the primary levels that is really causing um, a lot of the deaths and so we wanted to interrogate that a bit more. Now I'll skip through some of these things. If you look at the social background, they haven't changed very much between uh, post-NRHM uh, and pre-NRHM. They're all very young women, uh, primary gravids. Um, they're not necessarily the most poor, but you know, gender adversely affects all of their lives. Uh, where did the deaths happen? Uh, if you look at the table on the extreme right, there is the column which shows where they happened post uh, 2009 and that's when the NRHM took place. Uh, the significant difference that we find is that whereas earlier one out of two of the women who died were well within the ambit of healthcare seeking, that number has gone up tremendously and it's probably no surprise given that the push towards institutions has uh, played such a big role. Now why have they died? Um, again, a lot of the deaths, I mean, the, is PPH. I mean, the numbers are small, so I shouldn't say lots, but most of the, the few deaths that happened that we have studied uh, were due to PPH, um, uh, cortical venous thrombosis, um, and um, uh, anemia, which was before uh, the NRHM actually took off. Uh, but there are a whole lot of uh, other things, but PPH is one of the big things um, that is there. We, um, you know, um, at fault here. In 2009 onwards, we find that it has shifted, that health system failures were responsible for three out of five of the deaths, but they are not the only, I mean, they also interact with family level failures. And then we found that one out of five of these women developed emergencies after getting to a PHC or a CHC and uh, the deaths were because of postpartum hemorrhage or maternal exhaustion which either didn't get identified early or which resulted because of mismanagement of the second or third stage of labor. So if you look at what are the different of the, of the failures, um, there are um, risks that are widely prevalent but which are not uh, adequately uh, identified or managed. Uh, there are complications which are not adequately recognized or managed. And then there is more egregiously the inappropriate clinical uh, mal the inappropriate clinical practices like the application of fundal pressure to hasten delivery. And there are a number of underlying reasons why this happens. It has to do with the technologies used for testing. It has to do with the protocols. It has to do with knowledge. And this is where the operations research showed that uh, Ayush doctors and, uh, and nurses were in fact very poor in terms of identifying atypical symptoms of risk. Um, and that um, the MBBS doctors were better um, and those who were trained in EMOC uh, were even better. 
Um, so training clearly is some is an issue that uh, is important. Um, there is the other fact of you know the 108 ambulances mechanically transferring women to PHCs and CHCs even if they need higher levels of care, uh, which actually puts an extra burden on these facilities which need uh, strengthening. Um, and that there is the crowding of CHCs as a result of this mechanical transfer, um, but limited staff, which leads to a lot of pressure and therefore the push towards um, in our inappropriate clinical practices. Ma Madam, you're running out of time. You okay. run out of time. You could shorten okay. it. Okay, can I, can I take another? Ah, two, please. Yeah. Okay, in, in terms of maternal death reviews, it's been seen as very important. We've compared our results with the forms that are uh, put out by the government. And uh, we found that um, uh, in, in two thirds of the form, uh, they have uh, the identification of the medical causes of death um, were inaccurate. Um, the distal causes of, uh, of the um, of deaths were not identified and that there were several instances instances of lapses by health providers that were either not uh, that were never recognized but that were deflected to the family or externalized away from uh, the individual to the health system and so there are a number of questions and issues around how the maternal death audits are structured including the form and the processes and so uh, the the conclusion that uh, that we come up with from our work is that, well, of course, there are important gaps um, and these lead to uh, consequences that can be quite tremendous. And therefore, it's important to close the gap uh, and have mechanisms by which you can learn from the experience of policy uh, implementation so that it can feed back into policy uh, improvement. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam.